While entrepreneurs are often lauded with creating new businesses and ideas, it is more often the case that change agents working within organizations or intrapreneurs are responsible for innovation and seeing those new ideas through to completion. Welcome to the Innovation Economy Entrepreneurs Series. I am your co-host, Adam Chen, an independent change management consultant and current president of AmenityLink, a property technology company. In this series, you will hear stories and insights from leaders within organizations that have had the courage to create new ways to move business forward. To listen to the latest episodes or sign up for the Innovation Economy newsletter, go to innovationeconomy.show or click on your favorite podcast app to make sure you hear the latest episodes. And now, on to the show. Today, my guest is Dan Cohen, current CIO and Director of Operations for the Amenity Collective. Dan, welcome to the show. Why don't you start by uh, introducing yourself and uh, telling our listeners a little bit about your current role? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I started my career with Tiger GPS, joined a college friend to really partner up to scale that business. Learned a lot around direct-to-consumer, e-commerce, sales, uh, building software to help support that business scale. Then after that, after we scaled and sold that business, I jumped to a digital agency called MindGrub based in Baltimore, where I had the experience building software. But at MindGrub, I actually got much more in-depth about understanding software development lifecycle and building uh, full product teams to really understand how, how to build those uh, big, powerful tools for larger scale businesses, as well as the complexities around integrating different systems to make sure they can handle more complex process. So based on those two experiences, I then that led me to my current role at the Amenity Collective where it started out as a holding company with decentralized suite of lifestyle hospitality service companies. And I was brought in to really drive the the process around bringing them together as an integrated platform for service delivery. And it really combined a lot of the experience I had in my two previous roles, where I learned how, how to scale a service business, as well as implement these large scale integrations and platforms to drive digital transformation for a large, large enterprise. That's great. And, you know, for our listeners, uh, you know, Dan Cohen and and I actually have a relationship uh, working at the Amenity Collective together. Actually, Dan, Dan hired me uh, into into a role in the company. So uh, there's a little bit of personal experience I have observing you right in, in action here at your current role. But Tell me a little bit, like you've worked for a couple different companies. You, you know, I I would call you an entrepreneur as I might define it, but you know, how would you define the word entrepreneur when when you hear that? Yeah. So, you know, the standard term everyone knows is the entrepreneurship. And and I view that as in the individual that can really move you from zero to one, right? You're really building something that completely doesn't exist and you know, you're creating that that change out of nothing. Just as important and impressive and difficult is the entrepreneur who takes the resources and the legacy process and business model and really understands how they can create growth and new opportunities inside of that existing operation. So that's sort of that unique internal change agent that really forms new sort of neural networks inside of an organization that that creates real, real change for them. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, you've been, you've kind of filled that role here at the Amenity Collective. I've seen it firsthand and and you work side by side with, you know, one of the founders of the business and, you know, in in your past, uh, you know, experience too, you've worked alongside entrepreneurs. So tell me a little bit more about what 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 skills or what attributes maybe differ you know between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur? Yeah, so entrepreneur really you know has a job of going out there and building a vision from scratch, going out there and raising capital, building resources uh, that don't exist, right? So they're really creating something from nothing. And that's their biggest challenge is how to get stuff done with next to no 
resources to bring something out into the world. The entrepreneur's challenge is really with presumably the opportunity to have resources at their disposal. It's more being a change agent, changing minds internal to the organization to understand how adjusting process, adjusting internal structure can really drive change and improve outcomes to the existing organization, right? So mm-hmm. they're, they're changing culture to figure out how we can better redeploy existing resources, not just finding them and, and creating them. Mm. I really like that. I'd like to dig into that more. You know, it, it is it is definitely a cultural impact. I think and we'll talk more about that later on in the episode. But um, you talked about people a little bit and a applying those resources maybe in more effective ways. So, you know, from your experiences, you know, what strategies and tactics have you used to get the buy-in to communicate that and then facilitate that change of, uh, you know, resources being reallocated? Yeah. So I think it all starts understanding what the organizational goals truly are. Right. And, and then it's coming to the table with here's, a unique way or a different opportunity to really achieve those goals, right? And instead of just saying, we're going, uh, you know, building a, a ladder and we go to rung one, two, three, it's, we can be creative and try and accomplish these things in, in a unique way to get to our overall aspirational goals. That may be a new business model. It may be leveraging new technology. It may be building out new process to allow people to work in different ways. And I think that sort of experience where, where there I came to the table from our, my previous businesses, I sort of understand how to grow an internal agency inside of this group of service companies to really be able to more efficiently and effectively leverage our scale to service each of them directly, right? And bringing that new set of skills allowed us to actually have new calculus in terms of what our opportunities really were. So I think when you can bring a unique skill set and experiences to the organization that they haven't had before, that enables them to think about things in a different way and then find new solutions that weren't necessarily available to them before. Interesting. Interesting. Well, so a follow-up question then, you know, as you're trying to think about, you know, forming a team here to to affect this change, you know, how, how do you find the right balance between folks that are already part of the organization or perhaps, you know, identifying some some skill gaps and bringing in somebody from the outside? Yeah, I, I think you absolutely need to evaluate all the talent that's already there, understand what their skill set is and understand how the organization wants to grow right? And how we can potentially continue to deploy people to be in positions where they can be successful. I think where you can see gaps based on new strategies, that's where you start looking at what are some unique experiences we can bring in so that we can be overall stronger as an organization. And I think where that's really successful is, especially when you're trying to affect the cultural change, focus on innovation, have people drive to bring creative solutions to the table. You really have to focus on key goals, not necessarily locking in on specific tactics, right? And if you have people Mm -hmm. that are creative, passionate, capable, and have the appropriate experience, you really want to just give them a framework and a direction and then really allow them to come to the table with what will work best. Yeah. As, as kind of a follow up there, you know, in your mind, as you're thinking about building high performing teams, you know, what distinguishes, you know, perhaps a leader or an entrepreneur versus just a really good, you know, employee that you want to retain? Yeah, so so you definitely need to balance both. A good employee uh, will really hold themselves accountable, right? And they'll have tasks and responsibilities and they'll be hyper focused on making sure they meet those goals and targets where an entrepreneur really thinks about it from a sense of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where that magic comes in terms of thinking of sort of unique and new opportunities to accomplish those goals and to leverage those those high-performing employees in the best way possible, right? So always thinking about, is there a more efficient 
new and effective way to deploy those resources, knowing that we have a unified and aligned goals and mission uh, at the organizational level. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us, uh, you know, a little bit more, I guess, I want to dig into this cultural concept and, and, and ownership. You know, I think, you know, in my experience, the culture truly is the root cause here that either enables or, you know, enables ownership to happen or, you know, prevents it from happening. So, you know, what are those attributes of a culture? Or how do you think about building a culture in which people can assume that type of ownership that you're talking about? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Culture really is the key. and And I think... The way I try and focus on that culture uh, of innovation is in a couple of different ways. One, we focus on outcomes, not tactics, right? When we're managing folks, we're bringing on high-performing individuals. We trust them that they're capable to get the job done, and we want to give them the bandwidth to be creative, right, on how they're going to accomplish their particular task, knowing that they're going to try and find the best way to, to get it done. So really focusing on sort of more of a framework and sort of laddering up our goals to make sure outcomes ultimately then at each level of the organization layer up to our overall our overall goals. The second piece is to really make sure people are comfortable with failure. We certainly want to fail cheap and we want to fail quick, but we do not want to pe- have people feel uncomfortable with failure. They want I want folks to based on that framework and not dictating tactics, really have the opportunity to play and try things. And that's how we sort of find those best practices that we can ultimately fully adopt longer term. Mm, Yeah. Well, I I know from personal experience, the one thing I've always appreciated about about your leadership style, Dan, is is you have given me the space to own things, and uh, you know, given me the environment where I, I'm not afraid of failing, but uh, using it as a learning opportunity, right? To to you know, obviously adjust moving forward, and that's worked really well for me. So so I, I do want to thank you for that. I, I, what I'm curious about, though, is you know, I'm biased towards the the firsthand experience I have, right? Does that same approach work with other entrepreneurs or high-performing individuals in your experience? Or do you, you know, adjust your style based on, you know, the particular individual? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think we always have to, you know, be a little bit flexible in terms of how we work with folks based on how they best respond. You know, certainly uh, I'll take the opportunity to, to mention how much I've appreciated getting to work with you. It was an exciting opportunity when there was a good fit to bring you into the organization and really help drive a lot of uh, change and and digital transformation with some of our business lines. And uh, to see you grow and evolve that role into your strengths. And I think that's how you build a a highest performing organization is, is allow people to sort of organically understand both where their skill set is is best applied and where they have the most interest and fulfillment in terms of accomplishing those goals. So seeing you flourish in those ways from initially driving digital transformation on the tech side to then driving marketing team and marketing goals based on your marketing technology background to now driving in your own entrepreneur way building out the ownership and trust in driving our, our, our technology division and amenity link that's really started to flourish in the last 18 months. So thank you so much for, for being a perfect example inside of our organization of how, how that works. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, getting to work with you has, has been really helpful. We have a couple of other um, really amazing performers inside of the organization that I've been able to, to work with give, uh, you know, that framework on, on what we're trying to accomplish. And then you've really been creative to really have the, the drive and the creativity to really carve out that niche that, that brings that value to the organization. When working with others that are more comfortable sort of in that accountability role, less so the, the, the ownership role, yeah, then you have to lean in a little bit more, give them, you know, s- some tactics, some options and uh, some learning opportunities so so that they can continue to grow in that own role and figure out where they are comfortable 
starting to take on more of that ownership role. So it's about, you know, giving them those learning, training and development opportunities as well so that they can sort of learn how to develop that muscle. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about that more. I mean, obviously, you know, you started your career kind of as an entrepreneur, right? You've facilitated an environment where I can thrive as an entrepreneur. So kind of entrepreneurship begets entrepreneurship. You know, what advice might you give to other folks that need to kind of perpetuate this type of entrepreneurial culture? Um, are, are there specific tactics or tools or ways of thinking about things that, you know, may, maybe our listeners could kind of pick up on and, uh, and try to apply some of this in their own organizations? Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of it starts with letting go a little bit and really trusting uh, the people around you and giving them the opportunity to flourish. So, you know, if, if you're not trusting the team around you and you're really dictating step by step exactly what they need to do to make sure that that your goals are accomplished, that's what you're going to get, right? And, and where the magic really happens is when you start to let go a little bit, trust the process and your people, then you start to see them feeling more creative and bringing more uh, solutions to the table, right? So I think as, as you sort of build that trust um, step by step with, with the, uh, your employees, they're going to show you what they're capable of and, and will build that entrepreneurial spirit. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you, you know, in some ways, I guess, entrepreneurship begets entrepreneurship. So, so are there any specific tactics, tools, things that you apply, you know, or ways of thinking about the world that help people pay it forward? You know, how do you train others basically to, to adopt this mentality and, and what obstacles have you faced? Yeah. So I think the real skill there is to really understand that balance between sort of letting go and, having clear oversight into the process really and understanding what the output is and how the folks you're trusting and, and trying to grow are approaching the problem, the task, the responsibility, right? So sometimes it involves helping to coach their process and how they're thinking about it so that they can continue to use their creative muscles. Other times it's really just getting your own comfortability on having oversight or insight into their process and, and timelines and, and, and how we're going to structure these things into milestones so that you can track progress, right? Because ultimately, we all need to be held accountable to the output and, and achieving outcomes for the organization. And it's a matter of making sure we leave room for, for both trial and error and creative creativity in the process but also understanding how we're going to hold ourselves accountable to achieving achieving goals by certain timelines, right? So what, what's that oversight while also leaving room to, to let the person flourish? I want to make sure you know about the other podcast from the Agile brand, the award-winning show about marketing strategy, technology, and the customer experience and building the brand of the future. It's called The Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom. And in it, we talk with leaders at some of the world's top brands, the MarTech platforms that are leading the way, and other thought leaders in marketing, CX, and digital transformation. Now in its fifth year with over 400 episodes and 1 million downloads, make sure you check it out with new episodes Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. To listen to The Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can go to theagilebrand.show. That's the agile brand dot show. Now let's get back to the show. You know, you've kind of talked about a couple of these things already. You know, I'm wondering if we can like t tie it together. But, you know, there's something that we often talk about here about like people, process and platforms, you know, and, and you've talked a lot about the importance of process. And obviously, we're talking a lot about the people here as well. And we've partnered on implementing platforms. But when I say people process platform, you know, how would you interpret that? What's that mean to you? Yeah, the, those are the, the, the key points on, on how an organization gets their job done. So I, what I've found is that as an organization scales, Really, the the dif difficulty is keeping uh, those three pillars in alignment, 
right? And where I've seen challenges as I've tried to scale different organizations in different ways is pushing forward too far ahead with one of those pillars without understanding their interconnectedness with the other two. So there's always needed to be an understanding of, of as we move forward with uh, implementing new technology or creating new new process, you know, that may involve new structure for the personnel, or as you bring in key hires, that may mean, you know, you need new technology to support some of the amazing ideas they may have. So part of that entrepreneurship is really understanding that balance and how we can deploy resources to make sure those things uh, really stay in lockstep. Hmm. Yeah, you've also mentioned resources a number of times. And, you know, even if we think about people and processes and platforms as, you know, other, you know, sides of that coin, I guess, you know, what comes to mind to me is budgets. So I'd love, you know, to ask you, you know, how do you work with other executives to think about budgeting for the time, the, the dollars it takes to make sure that those three pillars stay in sync? Yeah, so it's the the three T's, right? Time, talent, and treasure, right? And you got to kind of budget for all three. Yeah, I, I think when you set off on a on a journey for a new initiative, you need to both be realistic, but also get buy in and alignment across the the leadership within the organization. Because if folks are pulling in different directions, there isn't full alignment. Again, those pillars might get out of lockstep, right? You introduce new technology that may allow you to sort of reduce the need for certain types of resources, but add different types of resources or redeploy resources in different ways. So um, if folks don't understand all the different points in the journey and how you can sort of leverage the different opportunities, then instead of getting sort of the best of, of all worlds, you're getting the worst. So That's where everyone needs to sort of work together, pull along in the same direction to make sure as those full organizational changes get made, that change management really, really holds and and people understand the movements that need to happen to really harvest the best results. Yeah, yeah. So thinking back through all of your experiences, you know, here at the Menity Collective, uh, you know, working side by side with you has been great. But, you know, even going back to your time at the agency or, you know, even before that with with Tiger GPS, I mean, reflecting back, what, what are some of the key lessons that you've kind of learned or, or maybe paradigms that have, you know, you've been able to kind of challenge, uh, you know, as you've kind of evolved through your career when it, when it relates to, you know, entrepreneurship and this culture thing that we keep talking about? Well, one of the things I always tell myself is do not be scared to operate yourself out of a job. Mm. I've always found that once if I'm actually truly successful in creating that change or, or scaling a certain component that will allow us to operate more freely, remove myself from, from different, different uh, processes or key workflows, I find that gets us to another interesting challenge that we can be creative to solve, right? As we get to larger and larger sizes of the business and and reach new scale, it creates new challenges and new opportunities. So I'm always excited to get over that hump, get to that next level or that next milestone and figure out what are those new challenges that I can be creative and and, and my own self continue to be an entrepreneur and build build out those changes. So I've always been excited to really accomplish that goal of really making things go so smoothly that I'm, I remove myself from the process mm-hmm. and allow uh, either a team or a platform to flourish in the way that it was designed, because then um, we, get, we always find new challenges to attack. Hmm. You know, I, I hear you say that, and, and I think two things come, come to mind to me. You know, one of those things is, you know, bravery in the sense of lack of fear. And you had mentioned fear of failure before. And that's that's clearly something that I think drives a lot of people in my own experience to maybe resist change or resist innovation because they're they're feared fearful for their own jobs. Well, one of the really interesting things uh, to be a, a good entrepreneur, you have to bring really and get really great people around you. 
right? And, yeah. and some executives may be afraid if I get really strong people that are better than me at this, better than me at this skill, or better than me in that skill, then then maybe you know uh, I'll make myself redundant. Um, hmm. But that's really how you shine, right? Is have yeah. really fantastic people around you that are even better than you at, at, at where you have weaknesses, right? And then it makes it, uh, the whole organization infinitely more complimentary. And that's the best way that you can have confidence to actually remove yourself from a process or let someone have the space to really uh, be creative and thrive is if you have that confidence because you know how great they are and in a lot of ways are, are stronger than you at different skill sets where you may have a blind spot. Hmm. I love that. Confidence, maybe. Um, how's that relate in your mind to to aspiration? Because I think maybe that's another thing that I, I kind of pin to the word entrepreneur is somebody that has an intrinsic drive, right, to do something, right, and create something. Like, how, how do you think about aspiration when evaluating talent? Yeah, that can can seem threatening when when you bring really ambitious people around, but but that's part of that entrepreneurial spirit and. Yeah having people around you that truly do take ownership, right, uh, of a specific initiative, right? And if, if they truly own that, that just um, scales you, right? Because that's less brain power that you need to apply to that when you can fully trust that someone's owning it just as you would, right? And truly mm -hmm. cares and understands the meaning of done. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious how you look at, at work. You know, we hear work-life balance all the time, you know, nowadays and, and on social media and the press, you know, especially with hybrid work becoming such a thing. I know one of the things I, I struggle with is, is where is that right balance? You know, I, I work at home uh, most days and, and how do I kind of shut off my brain, I guess, when it comes to work? I think you're, you're talking a little bit about things too and culture and ownership and like that you know, I'm an integrator, I guess is where I'm going with this, right? I, I combined my work, my, my personal, and that makes me care infinitely more for my colleagues and not wanting them to let them down, which helps, I think, build, you know, this, this culture kind of thing that we're talking about. But do you think about integrating those sides of the world? Do you think about keeping those separate? What helps create this environment that we're talking about best? Yeah, I, I think living in 2023 in the world of remote and, and hybrid work environments and cultures, I think work-life balance isn't necessarily the best way to think about it anymore. I think uh, I've, I've started to take the approach of more of work-life fluidity in the sense where you can't control uh, when good ideas come to you or, or when you have the inspirational bug or, or, or lightning strikes, right? And, and you have the motivation to accomplish something or think through things or map things out, whether you're in the shower or wake up from a, from a dream. And likewise, you can't control when your cable installer comes or, you know, there's a doctor appointment or your kid gets sick from school. And now there, there are certainly some disadvantages to being a little bit more disconnected from our employees by not getting into the same, same work environment and having, you know, just the, the water cooler talk and, and where those sort of just organic conversations spark creative ideas. But there are pros to having the opportunity to sort of work when, when the opportunity strikes. So I think that allows, again, more flexibility so that um, when you feel you can be productive, you have the tools to be able to. And when life and duty calls, you're able to handle handle that as well. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of what we're talking around, I, I think, is uh, around enablement in a lot of ways and enabling your employees to thrive. And, and that might look different in every organization, you know, or uh, everyone has a different starting point. So f final question for you, Dan, here today. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, culture if there's business leaders out there thinking, you know, listening to the show and thinking about how do I get started, what advice would you give them? So I think what had the most impact for me is when I started taking stock of our organizational's true goals and applying some design thinking principles to it. So the classic example of being 
no one wants a quarter inch drill. People want a quarter inch hole, right? And when you truly understand sort of the essence of the outcomes you're trying to accomplish, it really opens up a whole new suite of opportunities. So if you have a, a really strong facilitator or someone with those skill sets uh, available, or you need to bring someone from the outside, sometimes that's usually helpful because You're intentionally pushing people, especially those executive leaders that have that entrenched institutional knowledge to think a little bit differently, to, to, to move outside of their comfort zone, because that's where, you know, the real opportunities lie as opposed to just nibbling around the margin. So that's where sort of that true entrepreneurship spirit really comes from. So as you start sort of thinking that way, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, then you can take stock of, well, what do we need to accomplish these really new, interesting, uh, innovative ways to try and achieve these goals uh, for our organization? You figure out sort of what uh, resources you currently have and what are the gaps. And that's maybe where you need to focus and attack. I love it. Well, Dan, I want to thank you so much, uh, not only for joining this episode, but for allowing me to, to you know, shine as an entrepreneur myself. So thanks for coming on today. And this has been a really rich conversation. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. And thanks so much for all the great work you've been doing. Thanks again for listening to the Innovation Economy podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes at www.innovationeconomy.show or on your podcast platform of choice. The Innovation Economy podcast was created by The Agile Brand. Be sure to check out the Agile Brand guide series of books, the Agile Brand podcast, and other resources for marketing, CX, and other enterprise leaders to manage change and transformation in their organizations. The Innovation Economy is proudly produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, let's keep innovating.